High-speed rail in the U.S., a dream or a disaster? What if you could go from Los Angeles to San Francisco in less than three hours? No traffic jams, no airport hassles, no carbon emissions, just a smooth, comfortable ride on a cool train that zooms at over 200 miles per hour. Sounds awesome, right? Well, that's what millions of Californians thought they were getting. In 2008, they voted to pay for a high-speed rail project that would connect the state's big cities and help its economy and environment. But now it's 2023, and California's high-speed rail project is known for being a mess. It's faced delays, lawsuits, cost overruns, and political fights from the start. And all that's there today is this one part, still being built from Bakersfield to Merced. But the failure of this rail line isn't just California's problem. It's a bad sign for big projects all over the U.S. We see other countries that are ahead of us and building high-speed rail networks. They can do it, so why can't the U.S.? People have been thinking about high-speed rail for a long time. Even back in the early 1900s, some trains in Europe and America could go over 100 miles per hour with steam or electricity. But high-speed rail really became a thing after World War II, especially in Japan and France. Japan was the first to start a special high-speed rail line in 1964 with the Shinkansen, or bullet train. The Shinkansen made traveling in Japan much easier, linking Tokyo with Osaka in just four hours and later reaching other places too. The Shinkansen also showed how Japan bounced back from the war and became a leader in technology and inspired other countries to do the same. France was the next to join the high-speed rail club in 1981 with the TGV or Train Grande Vitesse. The TGV connected Paris with Lyon in just two hours and later went to other places in France and nearby countries. The TGV was also a big hit, attracting millions of travelers and competing with flying. Since then, high-speed rail has spread all over Europe, Asia, and even Africa with countries like Germany, Spain, China, South Korea, Taiwan, Morocco, and Turkey building their own lines. High-speed rail has shown to be a great way to travel, offering faster trips, lower pollution, and less traffic than cars or planes. But what about the U.S.? Why hasn't it joined the high-speed train club? Well, it's not because they didn't try. In fact, the U.S. became one of the first countries to try high-speed trains in the 1960s. After seeing Japan's example, President Lyndon Johnson asked Congress to figure out a way to make American trains faster. The result was the Metroliner service between New York and Washington, D.C., which started in 1969. The Metroliner trains could go up to 125 miles per hour on some parts of the track and averaged 90 miles per hour along the way. They were very popular, making money and attracting travelers from the air and road. The Metroliner service was later replaced by the Acela Express in 2000, which could go up to 150 miles per hour on some parts of the track. But despite these achievements, the U.S. failed to develop high-speed trains beyond the Northeast Corridor. There are many reasons for this failure. Too many politicians involved, local opposition, not enough money, legal problems, and lack of experience. One of the main challenges to building high-speed trains in the U.S. is the way the government works, which splits power between the national, state, and local levels. Unlike in countries like Japan or France, where the central government can plan and do big projects with relative ease, in the U.S., high-speed train projects need the cooperation and coordination of many actors with different interests and goals. For example, in California, the state had to deal with dozens of counties, cities, and agencies along the planned route, and each with their own demands and preferences. Some local politicians wanted the train to stop in their districts, even if it meant adding time and cost to the project. Others didn't want the train at all, fearing it would mess up their communities or harm their environment. The state also had to deal with the federal government, which had its own rules and requirements for high-speed trains. And of course, the state had to get money from both levels of government, which was not easy given the political division and budget limits that have affected Washington and Sacramento for years. Another thing that makes it hard to build high-speed trains in the U.S. is that a lot of people don't want them. They see them as a threat to their interests or lifestyles. Like in California, some farmers in the Central Valley were not happy about the train going through their land, crops, and irrigation systems. 
they sued the state, saying the state had violated their property rights and ignored environmental laws. Some homeowner groups also sued the state because they didn't like the noise and vibration of the train near their homes. They said that the state had not studied or fixed the effects of high-speed trains on their quality of life. Another group that opposed high-speed trains was the ones who made money from other modes of transportation like airlines, car makers, and oil companies. They lobbied against high-speed trains because they were afraid they would lose customers and profits. They also paid for campaigns to turn public opinion against high-speed trains, making them look like a waste of money or a boondoggle. A third thing that makes it hard to build high-speed trains in the U.S. is that they cost a lot of money. And unlike other countries like Japan or France where high-speed trains are seen as a good investment and a public good, in the U.S., many politicians and taxpayers see them as a luxury or even a burden. As a result, high-speed train projects have trouble getting enough money from federal, state, and private sources to pay for their costs and finish their plans, one of which is California where the first estimate for building a high-speed train line from Los Angeles to San Francisco was $33 billion in 2008. But by 2023, the estimate had gone up to $128 billion because of inflation, design changes, delays, and lawsuits. However, the state only had about $30 billion available from voter-approved bonds, federal grants, and cap-and-trade revenues. The rest of the money was uncertain and depended on future political decisions and economic conditions. Moreover, high-speed train projects have faced frequent changes in funding levels and priorities depending on which party is in power at any given time. A case in point is 2010 when the Obama administration gave $8 billion for high-speed train projects across the country, including $3.5 billion for California. But in 2014, the Republican-controlled Congress stopped any further funding for high-speed trains and moved the money to other transportation needs. This left many high-speed train projects hanging and forced states to look for other sources of funding or scale back their dreams. Another thing that makes it hard to build high-speed trains in the U.S. is that they don't have much experience or expertise in doing such a big and new project. Unlike in other countries like Japan or France, where high-speed trains are a normal and proven technology, in the U.S., high-speed trains are a new and strange concept for many engineers, contractors, regulators, and operators. As a result, high-speed train projects have faced many technical problems, learning curves, and knowledge gaps along the way. One of which is California, where the state body in charge of the project, the California High Speed Rail Authority, has never built anything like this before. It had to hire consultants and contractors to handle the design and construction of the project, which increased the costs and risks. It also had to deal with many regulatory and safety issues that were unique to high-speed trains, such as track standards, signaling systems, electrification, interoperability, and environmental impacts. It also had to coordinate with existing railroads that owned or shared some of the tracks or corridors that the high-speed train would use. All of these factors added to the complexity and uncertainty of the project. Despite these challenges and obstacles, high-speed trains are not dead in the U.S. There are still some projects that are moving forward or being proposed in different regions of the country. Like in Texas, a private company called Texas Central Railway is planning to build a high-speed train line between Houston and Dallas using Japanese bullet train technology. The project is expected to cost $20 billion and be done by 2027. The company says it will not use any public money or subsidies and that it will make money from ticket sales and real estate development. The project has received federal approval and state support, but it still faces some opposition from landowners and lawmakers who are worried about its impact on property rights and rural communities. Another one is Brightline West, formerly known as Express West, which is another private venture that aims to build a high-speed train line between Las Vegas and Southern California. The project is expected to cost $8 billion and be done by 2027. The company plans to use electric trains that can go up to 200 miles per hour on a dedicated track along Interstate 15. The project has received federal and state approval and funding but it still faces some challenges from environmental groups and local governments 
who are worried about its impact on wildlife habitats and water resources. A third one is the Northeast Corridor, which is the busiest and most profitable passenger rail corridor in the United States. It connects Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington, D.C. with regular and high-speed trains operated by Amtrak. The corridor has been upgraded over the years to allow for faster speeds and more capacity, but it still suffers from congestion, aging infrastructure, and maintenance issues. Amtrak has proposed a plan to build a dedicated high-speed train line along the corridor that would allow trains to go up to 220 miles per hour and reduce travel time significantly. The plan is estimated to cost $151 billion and take more than 25 years to complete. However, the plan has not received any money or commitment from the federal government or the states involved. These examples show that there's still some interest and potential for high-speed rail in the U.S., but they also show that there are still many barriers and uncertainties that need to be overcome. High-speed rail is not a simple or cheap solution for improving transportation in the U.S. It requires a lot of planning, coordination, funding, cooperation, and innovation from various stakeholders at different levels of government and society. It also requires a vision and a will to make it happen. I hope you enjoyed watching this video and learned something new. If you want to support our work and see more videos like this one, please subscribe to our channel and share this video with your friends. Thank you for watching and see you next time.